Welcome everyone to the last session of the 2021 Wise Power Week. Uh, it is, uh, my, my name is Jen Xian Lin, I'm the uh, session chair. Um, and then uh, my session co-chair is uh, Professor Naoki Shinohara from Kyoto University, wow. Japan. Um, and then it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce you our last speaker of the Wise Power Week. And for the um, very important subject, very important topic, the uh, standard for the wise power. Okay, so now uh, today's uh, the last uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Jesse Schneider. He's the chair of the SAE Wise Power Transfer Tax Force, Tax Tax Force, and also CEO CTO at the GEB stations. So, uh, Mr. Schneider has a long career, over twenty years, pioneering the zero emission vehicles. Um, pushing the envelope, uh, including the uh, electric vehicle and also fuel cell vehicles, and the, also their associate infrastructure, working in both US and Germany. So he led uh, several worldwide firsts and the development related to the electric fuel cell vehicles in uh, several major companies, um, including the BMW, uh, Mercedes Benz, and the Nikola Motor. So the, in uh, at B, for example, in BMW in Germany, he managed the BMW 530e plug-in hybrid wireless charging specification. Uh, Mr. Schneider established a startup company called DEB Station in California recently to bring together this passion, his passion of the zero emission vehicles uh, to the front core. Uh, that's again, including both uh, EV charging and uh, fuel cell vehicle hydrogen fueling. And he led of many uh, first international standards for um, hydrogen fueling infrastructures. And also the, uh, he established, in the SAE, he, he established the wise power transfer standardization for electric vehicles uh, several years ago. And then recently published the SAE J2954 as the first worldwide standard for wire charging of electric vehicles and then continue to the, the heavy duty vehicle in the J2954-2. Okay. So let's welcome Mr. Schneider and learn more about his topic. So Jesse, you can take it over, share your screen. Okay, well, first, uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I'm, and uh, I'm very honored to be here in this wireless power transfer uh, week, uh, especially being the the final uh, keynote. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to talk about um, something that's already done, and also also some some future work in the standardization of wireless power transfer for electric vehicles. Um, and SA 2054 is a standard that um, that has been published. And I'll go. I'd like to go over the a little bit of the standard. Certainly, there have already been parts of the presentation shown in other places. Uh, I'd like to mention that it's more than just a standard, there are actually tests that was done in the laboratory and the vehicle. And in addition, we've been very active in regulations and, and with ITU and FCC. Uh, we've given a number of petitions. And I'd like to show you just a preview of what's coming up in high power, heavy duty charging, static dynamic uh, in SA 2054-2. So certainly everyone knows here in terms of expertise and uncertainty uh, that Wireless power transfer is the, is the game changer. Um, it's, it's a firm belief of the committee that commercialization of this will also uh, increase the amount of electric vehicle acceptance, certainly auto automated, touchless, transparent to the customer charging um, and parking is possible. And what's really unique also with the alignment that we're giving in SA 2054 and communications of 2046 is enabling automated taxis. So with that said, what I'd like to do is take a step back and first talk about where we are in the other side of the electric vehicle. Um, multiple conductive charging standards. You know, well, there's a number of standards around the world, uh, from the U.S. to to uh, to to China, Japan, and Europe, and some industry standards. And the good news is that they work; they're safe, but they're they, unfortunately they're not all compatible. Um, and one thing we did in starting with the standardization says we would like to have a goal to have at least a metaphorical plug, a universal ground assembly. And that's what we did. We've actually uh, 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 
made, done a number of uh, uh, testing studies and also simulations to arrive at a universal GA that will, that will uh, charge all vehicles essentially um, that wireless charging up to WPT3, which is 11 kilowatts. And what's also unique, certainly it comes from SA 2054, but also we've shared that with IEC and also GBT uh, and ISO. So truly unique. Um, we actually have formal harmonization between ISO and IEC. We talk directly with, uh, with Qatar, with GB. We've had in interface with them. We've also had an interface with Germany, Project Stille. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, uh, ITU, FCC, and CISPR, uh, we're, we're directly in, in, in contact with them with the purpose of harmonization, uh, not just standardization, but harmonization to arrive at that single um, uh, charging point with WPT. Um, I just want to mention uh, that one thing is, is should be known is that there's communication side to that, uh, to, to wireless power transfer, that's 2847. That six on, on the on the SAE side, and there's ISO and IEC uh, standards as well. And in terms of the ground assembly, there's an IEC standard, 61980-3, and for the vehicle assembly, there's uh, ISO 19363. The difference between their standard and our standard is we have one standard for for, for the entire system, and that allows sort of a cookbook. For the automaker and the infrastructure provider uh, and anyone who'd like to do uh, also development in wireless power transfer to, to use our standard uh, for, uh, for understanding compatibility, interoperability, safety, um, and also testing, validation thereof. Uh, there is a, a parallel standard for, for certification or verification that's 2750. That's a draft standard in, in progress right now. So just, take, just taking an overview, uh, 2054 is safety limits and targets. And we actually are giving recommendations to EMC, EMF limits, uh, vehicle to, to EDSC alignment methods. So we give recommendations also on how the vehicle can align. There's a number of methods that can be used. Um, interoperability specification, uh, ex what is acceptable for charging and also verification testing and confirming that either a new design or or a design that's meant for production, uh, it actually comply or not complies, but it, uh, is valid according to J2054. Uh, this took over a decade to do, but we're very confident that, that this, is, this is the way forward. Um, just certainly you've seen this before, just wanna mention WPT1, two and three are 3.7, 7.7 7 and 11 kilowatts each. And um, WPT4, uh, is, is goes up to 22 kilowatts. All this is for light duty wireless power transfer. And just, just so it's understood, certainly there are a lot of folks on the technical side here. You know, the ground assembly covers everything from, you know, from the AC uh, to a DC inverter, uh, filter, and the coil. Uh, there's a coupled circuit. Some, they use some magnetic resonance as well to the, to the VA coil uh, where, where, the, um, where the power is transferred. Uh, over the IM, IM and, and filter and rectifier, impedance converter all the way to the battery. And what's interesting here is that we're talking, in our standard, we say 85% aligned, 80% misaligned. Even with this misalignment, you're still getting, um, uh, on average, mostly above 90% efficiency. In fact, we've seen up to 94% efficiency, uh, but we allow as low as 90, 85, which is also possible. Um, there are different Z classes, basically everything from sports car to sport utility vehicles, Z1, Z2, Z3, from 100 to 250 millimeters. And what this, all of these are uh, compatible to this one universal ground assembly. Um, you've probably seen this before. This also originates from SA 2054. We work directly with the American Association of Medical Instrumentation, which are the, the folks that make uh, standards for pacemakers also at ISO. Uh, we've also uh, referenced ICNRP. And we've come up with a coexistence, CIED coexistence specification and also human exposure specification. And, and keep in mind, we are referencing international standards as our limits as well. We see ICNR 2010, 27 micro Tesla, um, and also basic restrict or basic restrictions as well. And we have different zones here, which cover underneath the vehicle, zone two, outside the vehicle, inside the vehicle. Um, and there are different limits associated with each one of these. Um, I'd like to also mention SA 2054 originated the frequency, the 85 
uh, kilohertz band from 79 to 90. That's also harmonized across standards and also with ITU and, and FCC. Uh, and that's something that's really critical, especially with this light duty to harmonize. I want to mention that this took a lot of doing, but you know we've we've uh, we've done a lot of research in this area and created an EMC limit recommendation. Uh, it's based on FCC Part 18, um, this 10 meter uh, test. And if you see the green line, that's essentially the, the WPT radio emission uh, limit proposal. And that's something also we've, we've submitted to, to, uh, to FCC and others. Um, so other characteristics I've mentioned, typical efficiencies, and this is also based on empirical data, are about 90%, as high as 94%. Uh, which means it's actually better in some cases than conductive charging. Um, it meets uh, human and CID EMF safety. Uh, we've also done tests with uh, in, in order to validate that to ICNRF uh, 2010 guidelines, human exposure. It meets all these interoperability requirements for light duty vehicles, meaning almost any vehicle that pulls up, you know, uh, in this class will get the same amount of, will get the same automated charging. Um, and also, this maximum alignment and misalignment. Uh, there's also something that I heard in other talks before about forward object detection. Uh, there is uh, a, a number of tests with actual objects that are standardized that are put on onto uh, onto a test stand where uh, to present unsafe metal, metallic object heating um, and meets uh, general interoperability requirements, including uh, controls and communication standards. Uh, so I want to mention that. Uh, there's a vehicle test and there's a bench test, and you know we're testing for for, for light coils and and and, and non-light coils and mismatch coils, and we have reference sets of coils actually specified in the document that can can be reproduced and put into a laboratory, and the idea is the first do it in the bench test and then do a vehicle test. Certainly there are different uh, characteristics when you put sheet metal or aluminum on top of it. Uh, so we actually specified a component test stand and a vehicle test stand, including a turntable. So a turntable for an entire vehicle. Um, this is just showing some act, some testing at the Idaho National Laboratory uh, with the uh, with a, a system on it, the bench test system uh, testing at this point. I think it was 7.7 .7 kilowatts, and you know all, all the different components and layout of of where the GA and VA are located, and also how how they will be uh, uh, tested and, and also moved around essentially or specified therein. And one thing it should be understood, though I said we had a, a universal ground assembly, it means also we are not only compatible with different uh, um, power levels and different uh, heights, we're also compatible with different types of to uh, coil topologies. And we chose, that's another reason why this circular uh, topology was, was uh, chosen, because it's possible to have a double D and a circular topology be uh, aligned and also even have high efficiencies with this as well. And this is something where if you're interested in finding out more, there's uh, all sorts of published reports that we have done of, of testing data to validate this, all the way up to 11 kilowatts. Uh, I want to mention this is actually shown from some of the pictures in, in TDK that were in testing that was done um, that, that covered everything. If you see here, there's a, a WPT a measurement boundary um, and there's a, a also a specification of where the testing is, and this this uh, actual um, turntable that that turned the first the components, and then actually the vehicle was placed upon that as well to do a 360 degree measurement, and to have a standard standardized method of doing this. All of this you'll find in SA 2954. In addition, uh, there's EMF site uh, with measurement equipment of the vehicle testing. Um, this one is particularly showing the, the circular topology, but there were testing that were done on EMF with uh, match coils and also non-match coils, uh, purposely to try to uh, use the misalignment to see uh, to make sure that there are no issues with any stray fields. And it, it needs to be understood that all these this data was published. In fact, we actually decided to go to a circular coil as a baseline because of the results of this test, meaning the lowest results were found in the circular coil uh, baseline. Uh, 
I mentioned before that there is published reports. Uh, there was a, a, an EMFs, EMC test in 7.7 .7 kilowatts that, that was uh, published, I think, in 2009. More recently, uh, the 11 kilowatt test was done, also including tests performed in the US FDA running uh, pacemakers. So we actually uh, did a, a test with the, uh, w, the standardized systems in, 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 SA, in SA 2054 that was done in witness and together with the US uh, Department of FDA uh, to show that there are also with, with Amy, which is the American uh, Association of Medical Instrumentation, to show that the yields were, were, were low, uh, low enough to, to be acceptable and, and also that they didn't interfere uh, with running, running pacemaker. So the, and all this data was, pub, was published um, and we used this as a validation of the final standard. Most recently published this year also was uh, we actually did a test together with a, a, a UK based uh, amateur radio group where uh, tests were, were done in, in collaboration. Um, it's a study that was also submitted to ITUR and also provided by CEPT SC24. Essentially, it's showing that wireless power transfer uh, also doesn't have uh, interferences with amateur radio. And that's another point of consideration as well. So all of this due diligence, uh, bench testing, vehicle testing, and um, you know pacemaker testing and, and, and an amateur rating were done to make sure that what we were publishing in SA2054 not only had high efficiency, not only uh, was good performance, uh, but also was safe and didn't interfere um, even with amateur rating and, and interfere especially with, with medical devices, that sort of thing. Um, so I wanna mention in turn to just two petitions. So even though we are a standards body, uh, we found that uh, we, we, because we've done these data reports that we, we like to, to share the, the opinion of the group uh, and submit the, the standards uh, work also, also to, these, to these bodies, also, especially regarding frequency, it's already been a, a really big success. Uh, we think um, finding this 85 kilohertz Band. A lot of that came from this SA2054 petition. And most recently, actually uh, last month, uh, we submitted a petition to the FCC. And the task force really was talking about, um, you know, adopting the radiated radi 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 emission limit, 82.8 uh, decibel microampere meter, and the, the frequency band, 79 to 90 kilohertz. And, and really use uh, another standard, ANSI C63-3, uh, to actually uh, use as guidance for uh, the open area test site, the OET. Um, and really uh, also we're using ICNERP and referencing the 20, 20, 2010 version of 27 micro Teslas. So I wanna mention that uh, we've, been, we've been lucky to, be, to also have, have that um, discussion, not only publishing the standard last year, but also talking to the regulators to, to give them our guidance as well. And we're also recommended to use the EMI limit as well. So with that said, actually, I wanted to give you something that's a, a graph. The reason is just to show you that in, 20, uh, in 2022, so next year, we're planning to do a guideline of 2054. And 2554, excuse me, dash two, uh, which is heavy duty. And it's going all the way up to, uh, you know, from uh, this is really around 60 kilowatts to 590 kilo, kilo, kilowatts. And the idea is to show you that there is high power uh, compatibility. This is going to take some doing, probably multiple years. Uh, but our first guideline, especially regarding power classes and application classes, are something that we're going to be publishing next year. Uh, so we're actually talking about opportunity charging. We are certainly starting off with static charging, uh, but dynamic charging is also coming to light. Uh, in some cases, using multiple coils on, on the vehicle, uh, but also covering depot charging and idling. And not only on the vehicle, but also on the trailer, because there are some refrigerated trailers that require a certain amount of power draw. Uh, so there's a loading and unloading aspect of that as well, and and even you know deal with with trailer uh, 
trailer and rigid truck uh, parking as well. And this is once again in draft form, but I'm, I'm showing this just to give you a flavor. If you'd like to, to join the team, this is an opportunity to join the standardization process. I wanna mention that you know, we're talking about truck and trailer standardized positions and Z height, reference and power classes. Um, and in, in most cases, we're starting in a static area, but there are already some efforts in Europe, for instance, and, and also in Israel, uh, that they're looking into dynamic charging. So certainly we're looking at all the experience and what's different from this type of, of application. There are already sort of uh, demonstration projects in the field, but what's different is also that some of these coils are already buried. You know, we, in, I should have mentioned before, a light duty, the ground assembly is above ground, but in heavy duty, in many cases, the uh, certainly there is applications uh, where it's above ground, but a lot of the high power stuff is actually flush or below ground. So this is this is a work in progress, and I just wanted to share with the community uh, if you'd like to to join this effort, uh, that I I would suggest you uh, contact SAE and and come join our committee. So this is uh, to wrap up. Uh, the standardization. So SA 2054 document is published after a decade, and we believe it's really an enabler to uh, wireless power transfer, light duty commercialization. Uh, this goes all the way up to 200 millimeters, you know, 10 inches of, of ground clearance, which covers sport utilities to sport to uh, uh, the sports cars. And we really think that we've, we've accomplished a standard that is like no other at least in the electric vehicle world, that it's the same if you go to Asia, to Europe, to the US, the Americas, we have a universal ground assembly um, and an interoperability guideline for the industry. Uh, and uh, also giving guidance, not only to the industry, but also to, to, to some, of the, some of the governmental agencies um, and also regarding frequency band uh, from, the, from the search that was done at the committee. Another useful part of it is main, you know, mainly for, 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 for automakers and, and industry uh, uh, infrastructure companies to do validation testing. But certainly if you take these uh, test stands and put them into a laboratory setup that is like a university, there's also innovation that could happen in terms of compatibility between these different coils. Uh, and you know, certainly we didn't talk too much about it, but there's also a, a lot of effort that's been done on the alignment and also finding a common parking lot spot to place this universal ground assembly uh, so that all these vehicles can park in that space. Uh, our, our target for J2054-2, the, uh, the, the guideline on heavy duty wireless charging is something we're gonna be starting the standardization pro uh, process with a guideline next year, a technical information report. Uh, and all the reports that I mentioned are available on the SA website uh, and or there are a few of them that are actually publicly available as well that you don't have to go and, and pay. Uh, but we wanted to show, the, to show you our transparent process and, and mention to you that, you know, there's a lot of it, a, empirical, there's a lot of analysis and, and also a lot of test, you know, also a lot of uh, teamwork that, had, that, we, that we needed to make this process happen. So I'm very thankful to the uh, SAE 2054 wireless, wireless power transfer team uh, to really, we traveled all the way around the world um, to, to make sure that we were harmonizing with uh, different industries and different standards organizations uh, and very, very humble to be part of the team. So thank you very much for the uh, opportunity for presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schneider for excellent talk. Um, we have a, a few questions coming already from audience, uh, so I'm going to just uh, help to read it uh, to you and then you can answer them live. The uh, first question is from Inder Markin. Dr. Inder Markin asks, could you comment on software security of operation and hackability of the EMWPT techniques? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very good question, um, and the good news is but that's actually related to another standardization group called cybersecurity. Uh, so there's actually an SAE standard standardization group on cybersecurity for the entire vehicle, not just the controller for the wireless power transfer. 
Um, and that is something that relates. Uh, certainly there, there needs to, you know, that is not finished, uh, but that's something that needs to be a priority in the near future. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question from uh, the, Dr. Thomas Ryan. So how are the coils protected? Uh, they are under and located on the car. And I imagine stones and debris and bottoming out uh, all occur frequently. Yeah, so there, uh, the coils are, are flush to the, to the body and there, there is so, you know, there is an opportunity to have shielding, I mean, but, but that shielding basically is, is if they wanted, if they didn't have an aluminum floor and, you know, should be EMC MF shielding. Um, but there is no requirement for, you know, that's something, what needs to be understood at least is that um, we don't standardize how it's done, but every automaker has, you know, every part of their vehicle um, has, to ha has to be uh, resilient to, to these, you know, to, to stones and rocks and that sort of thing, but that's not part of our standard. Our standard is is the, is the magnetic interoperability and safety and performance and alignment. Uh, but there are vehicle standards on, you know, keeping the components safe from, you know, from debris and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. And the third question coming from Yao Wang. Uh, the question is uh, the latest frequency band for SAE J2954 standard is 79 kilohertz to 90 kilohertz. Is correct? Is it correct? That's correct. That's correct. Great. Thank you. So, a reminder to all the um, audience you can either type in your question or you can raise your hand by using the icon uh, below um, the Zoom window. Um, Any question? Oh, I see the. Yes, uh, uh, okay. okay, go ahead, Naoki. Okay, so when, uh, until waiting for your questions, uh, I have uh, one question for. Uh, so thank you so much. So I'm very interested in the standardization of the uh, wireless power transfer, okay. and uh, so in my talk, uh, uh, in your talk. Uh, we've learned a lot about the uh, uh, wireless charging in uh, in uh, uh, in parking. So uh, I want to know the future expected or future uh, ex uh, future expected of the uh, dynamic wireless charger mm -hmm. for uh, driving EV. How do you think so, about it? So that's it's a very good question. The good news is that there's already sort of demonstrations of that in buses. Yeah. And that's where we're starting. We're actually looking at an application that's that's working, so to speak. Um, but it it's something that is a very wide field. You know, there's a demonstration, I believe, from Momentum Dynamics in um, Europe with semi-dynamic taxis. You know, and there's uh, Oliad, I think it's the name of the company, you know, from Israel. It's got a number of demonstrations. Um, it's a wide open space right now. But the good news is those companies, in order to participate in the standard have to tell us the location and also how we find interoperability because, um, so, so we, we've started in the dynamic side and that's been with multiple coils on the vehicle and, you know, sort of, and, and have a number, and we haven't yet standardized what's gonna go on the ground. Mm -hmm. So it is a dynamic topic to make a pun, but <laughs> um, yes, but it's, it's a, uh, we're starting with applications and we're expanding upon that it's important that the dynamic coils can also be compatible with a static coil. Um, and that's something that we're investigating as well. Mm. Uh, thank you so much, I expect it. Thank you. Okay, uh, okay so that's uh, another hand raise oh, from uh, Professor Fei Lu. Oh, hi. Um, hi, Jesse, thank you for the uh, good presentation. I did learn a lot from the SAE standard. So actually, so I uh, have been working in this area for a few years, and uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago, I got access to the uh, maybe the 2017 version of the SE standard. What I will mm -hmm. remember there is uh, the frequency range uh, at that time was uh, 81.38 to 90. That's correct. No, you're um, correct. Yeah. And uh, now you just mentioned also this follow up question about the previous. Uh, mm -hmm. um, why it's, I, mean, I just want to ask. Uh, why is in, uh, I mean increase the bandwidth to seventy nine, and what is uh, the motivation to increase the bandwidth, and 
what will be influenced by this new stand, new new uh, bandwidth? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. Um, we so we did a worldwide study at SAE, and that involves companies from Japan, from China, from U.S., from Europe, from in you know, Australia. And the idea was to find out, and make sure we didn't interfere anything. So interference. And at, originally, the band was actually possible at, at around 79, uh, but there was no one. There was no reason because there was no one commercializing that area. Um, it's really a harmonization effort. That expansion of the band came from discussions with Jari and from the Japanese, and also from GBT. And to that, the idea is to try to simply maximize the band. Uh, that that's not interfering with others. So that's really where it came from. It didn't come from a specific application, as far as I know, just to make sure that that you uh, that you're able to use the maximum bandwidth that doesn't interfere with other frequencies. Oh, thank you. So actually, um, this is also uh, one of my recent research in my group. So uh, me and my uh, students. So we are now working on uh, one um, uh, uh, control strategy. So we are trying to uh, to see. Uh, uh, inside of this bandwidth, so if we can vary the frequency, uh, then we can detune the uh, the resonant circuit. In this way, we can uh, regulate or adjust the uh, charging power. Then in this way, sometimes we don't really need to tune the input voltage, increase mm -hmm. it too much. In this way, we can, let's say, keep the input voltage constant. Then uh, we only regulate the frequency. In the, in, inside of this bandwidth, we could... Uh, Increase or decrease the power based on the charging uh, uh, requirement. I think mm -hmm. this. Um, so, uh, but we are not sure if uh, this uh, varying frequency charger is practical for the real application. Do you have any comments on this? Yeah, yeah actually, a lot. You know, a lot of the the they, they use a sort of a constant frequency. So, so mm -hmm. you know, I would suggest that you interface with uh, either someone in the industry or or, or try uh, to talk to. Some of the suppliers, you know, there's this electricity or momentum dynamics or wave, um, but yeah, I, I uh, from the standard point of view, any frequency within this bandwidth should be uh, usable, that's, right? That's that's correct from the standard point of view, um, okay. but keep keep in mind that um, you know compatibility is also proven on the test bench, and oh, and right. that's something, yeah, uh, but but still, um, yeah, it's it's possible. Uh, to be within that 79 and and, uh, and 90 kilohertz. Oh, so you just mentioned this uh, compatibility. So this is my last question. Is, um, um, so let's say we have two different OEM or manufacturer, and then um, we have two chargers. Uh, they can both charge, let's say, 7 or 11 kilowatts. Um, but they are using different frequency. Let's say one is using the... Uh, Lower limit to seventy nine. The other one is the upper limit to ninety. And uh, but how can they be compatible in in reality? Well, um, the, in that particular case, you know, there's a tuning circuit um, that, and also communications that is helpful. Um, but yeah, it, it finding a, a common frequency between them uh, would would you know basically help uh, the efficiency of the of the charging, and and the communications could help out as well. Okay, I, I would say this will be determined by the manufacturer and our standard is only here to uh, give the, the range where we can work on. Mm -hmm. Then, okay, I see. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And you're welcome. And you're welcome to send questions and, and even join the teams if you'd like. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, thank you. I guess due to the interest time, we have to uh, move on and want to thank the uh, JC, very much for giving this excellent talk. And also thank you for your effort leading the pushing for worldwide standard on wireless EV charging. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And then for audience, if you have further questions, I guess Jesse will stay for a while. Um, uh, then you can type a question in Q&A. Okay. Thank you. Now, okay, let's move on to the, um, the last technical session, TS9. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share the screen. Okay, coming up. Uh, that's interesting. It's not showing here. Can you see the share screen? 
Yes, I can see the. You can see that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, very good. So we have uh, seven papers in this uh, technical session. So again, just like previous sessions, um, we're gonna ask uh, each uh, presenter, paper presenter to talk about their, give us quick summary, two minute summary about their uh, paper. And then one by one, and then uh, after all finish, then we start the, the panel Q and A. Okay. So the first paper is the pre-charged Calasmo capacity micro machine ultrasonic transducer called CMOT for broadband ultrasound power transfer. The paper will be presented by uh, Mr. Shinosuke Kawasaki. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes. okay, so should I push for the next slide? Uh, yes, that would be great. Okay, here we go. Okay, so um, uh, uh, to set the background, uh, today I'd like to talk about uh, power transfer for implantable device. And what implantable device means is if you look at the left upper picture, you see a device that's currently uh, sold from set point medical, which is a device that is implanted at the left side of the neck uh, called the vagus nerve stimulator. And we expect that these uh, implantable devices will be more uh, proliferant, uh, more common in the future but not at shallow depths like the picture shown here, but more deeper, perhaps uh, five to 10 centimeters deep within the body. But when you think about devices being implanted quite deep in the body, it's very difficult to charge these devices with radio frequency or inductive coupling. That's why we see more uh, devices that utilizes ultrasound, which could be focused because of its short wavelength and has a low attenuation to the human body. However, we noticed that ultrasound uh, is typically being received with PZT elements. This is, stands for lead zirconate titanate. And since it requires lead, which is a toxic material for the human body, it is not very uh, uh, helpful for the human body. And it's not likely that the FDA would approve, approve it. In this work, I show a different technology called the pre-charged semen. A CMUD is a two membrane structure as shown on the bottom left side figure and uh, that's being micro machine. And in between these two membranes, there's a ch uh, charged layer of uh, positive charges, which attract the opposite polarity of charges on the top and bottom membrane. These my membrane vibrates and you could harvest ultrasound energy. We achieved a, a efficiency of nearly 50%. And uh, we have successfully shown that it could be uh, work at two megahertz to six megahertz. And it has the advantage of being broadband, biocompatible, monolithically integratable with IC. And I think that's about two minutes. So thank you for listening. And I'll be happy to answer questions later. Okay, thank you. So let's move on to the next paper. Number two is... Uh... A novel magnetic couple retina wires power transfer technique used in rotary ultrasonic machining process. Paper will be presented by uh, Xianpeng Chao from Southern University of Science and Technology. Okay. So, Xianpeng, ready? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, please proceed. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, now, uh, now let's introduce my paper. Uh, my research paper, the topic of my research paper is to increase the transmission distance uh, of the wireless power transfer used in rotary electronic machining. Let's see the right uh, picture. Uh, this is the existing uh, systems of the contactless power transfer uh, of rotary electronic machining involves a uh, uh, small transmission distance. They have uh, 0 0.1 to 1 millimeter. Uh, and uh, the core of the primary side uh, may collide with the core of the second side at the high speed, uh, high rotation speed. So uh, it's essential to increase the transmission distance uh, use the magnetic resonance. Uh, and uh, here is the here is the prime 
principle of my systems, the second coils and the, the electronic vibrator form a resonant tank. Uh, and uh, in the primary side, the primary coils connect a capacitor in series of parallels to form the resonance. Uh, and then I also introducing the mutual inductance model and the inductance model of the two spy tube coils. Uh, in the results, I have drawn the output power and the transmission efficiency as function of distance and the frequency. Uh, in the conclusion, uh, uh, I have uh, improved the transmission distance and uh, is for the transmission char characters. Uh, as the coil tends to increase, the, max, the transmission distance with the maximum output power transfer increased. And uh, second, uh, the division of the output power was found in the theoretic model and the division of the vibration amplitude of the ultrasonic vibrator was observed by the laser vibrator. However, there uh, one peak of the vibration amplitude of the ultrasonic vibrator uh, without the realized power transfer. Uh, that's all, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, move on to next paper. Uh, the title is the Selective Receiver Charging Using Acoustic Vibration Modes. Uh, the paper will be presented by Dr. Victor Cheng uh, from U.S. Army Research Lab. Victor? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, perfect and loud. All right, uh, please go to the next slide. So, uh, yeah, in our work, we're doing a different type of uh, power transfer in, in which we're using acoustic vibrational waves that propagate along the length of a metal plate um, to transfer power. And this type of wave um, is called guided plate waves, or in other words, LAM waves. So as seen in several other uh, work in this conference, acoustic WPT is actually a growing field. Um, and one of the most important advantages is that it can achieve higher efficiencies than inductive um, at larger distances, um, particularly due to the shorter wavelengths. But in this work, we're using another unique advantage of acoustic transfer in that um, it can transfer through metal without being shielded, at, um, especially thicker metal. So, um, and uh, like a schematic shown on the upper quarter here, we have like a plate light structure with a transmitter and receiver, both being piezo transducers attached to the um, surface of the metal plate structure and the transmitter sends out the LAM waves. And um, a high efficiency is achieved when standing wave modes are excited. And this type of wave is actually uh, the same as electromagnetic waves propagating through uh, waveguides. So a setup is shown there as well. And for practical purposes, we are targeting applications such as pipeline structure monitoring. And so in this case, we're having a transmitter array attached to the outer surface on one end and three sets of receivers attached to along the uh, along different uh, lengths on the steel tube. And this work, our novelty is that we are able to excite different receivers um, without exciting the other receivers selectively. So the method is shown uh, below there. So um, to transfer power to only one receiver, or one, not the other, the key is to select the right um, standing wave mode and the, the right location. So when standing wave modes are excited, the length of the tube is separated into several half wavelengths. And the targeted receiver has to be at the node location, which is between the red and blue shown over there, while the untargeted has to be placed on the anti-node locations shown there as well. So, um, so yes, so basically, um, and also in our, in our case, we are, we are, our transmitter array is using frequency tuning to find different uh, uh, most to excite the uh, different receivers and also can adjust the configuration to rotate the node to target different uh, receivers at different locations, different rotations. So some key outcomes is shown over here. In this work, we primarily present uh, for R1 and R2, those two receivers. We can show that the 18 kilohertz and 20 kilohertz modes, they are sort of the um, uh, opposite of each other. When, uh, so at 18 kilohertz, uh, receiver one has high efficiency peak while receiver two has a rejection close by, although they're slightly mismatched due to experimental variations. 
and uh, vice versa for 28 kilohertz. So it's a, uh, in this case, we've proven that um, you can excite one but reject energy transfer to the other. And uh, so conclusion, uh, this can be said for the first demonstration ever of a selective power transfer to receivers using different acoustic modes and uh, also, we were able to transfer up to one watt to prove the feasibility as shown in the lamp lighting up over there. And we're still doing some tests on the receiver three, which um, uh, we're still seeing if we can increase the efficiency and for that one and prepare that one for another publication. And ideally, this can be used for structure health monitoring for pipelines or uh, gas canisters where you need um, uh, some kind of a, a network, a sensor network embedded within. So thank you, that concludes my talk. Thank you. So next paper, the title is the design of ultrasonic transducer structure for underwater wise power transfer system. Uh, the speaker is the Yu Fei Zhao um, from the yeah. University. Uh, thank you, can, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Uh, okay. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's very glad to do the presentation here. We are from Xi'an Jiao Tong University, and I'm Yu Fei Zhao. I will give today's speech in place of Professor Zhen Xing Wang. And it's a great pity that we cannot come to the set to exchange views with all the experts and scholars. Uh, it's presumable that you have all seen the videos we uploaded. Here I will give a brief review of our article design of ultrasonic transducer structure for the water wireless power transfer system. Uh, firstly, uh, our objective is to make a power supply for underwater equipment. Uh, ultrasonic wave was chosen because of its strong deactivity and to perform good in long distance transmission. Our aim is to propose a design concept of ultrasonic transducer to improve the transmission efficiency. And secondly, we use the theory of transmission matrix, Mason's equivalent circuit and the uh, vibration modes of electric piezoelectric ceramics to build the design concept. Then we use COMSO for simulation and carried out uh, experimental verification. And thirdly, our key results show the input impedance curves that we test, the resonant frequency we calculated, and the sound pressure image drawn by the software. Uh, at the time of the paper submission, our experimental efficiency is 20%. However, after our experimental improvements in May, the experimental efficiency has exceeded 50%. The power transmission is already enough to light a bulb. Uh, in our conclusion, the, our conclusion can provide some reference for the design of transducer for underwater UWP system. Uh, it can be seen that uh, for a UWP system, uh, design the structure and the frequency of the transducer and figure out the vibration mode of the piezoelectric uh, ceramics and to restrain the unwanted mode to uh, increase the performance of the transducer. Uh, that's how, thanks for your listening. Okay, thank you. So let's move on to the next paper. Uh, the paper title is uh, a novel hybrid class D topology with low independent output for WPT. Uh, speaker is uh, Hu Ji Li from the Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Hello, Professor. Yes, we can hear you. Can you, can you hear me clearly? Very clear, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, every professor and student. My name is Li Hu Ji. I'm from Shanghai Jiao Tong University of China. Today, it's my honor to share my conference paper here. Um, the other two authors are Professor Liu Ming and Professor Wang Yu. Uh, as we all know, Class E circuit has an advantage of fair components, high reliability, but traditional Class E always using low power application and have a narrow ZVS range. Uh, in order to uh, extend the range of ZVS and uh, the power level, and uh, we want to find a simple way to achieve CC and CV output. This paper proposed a novel hybrid class circuit like this paper, uh, this figures. Uh, this hybrid totally introduced a SCL composition network and a four bridge rectifier in class C circuit as well. Moreover, the proposed topology can achieve constant current and constant voltage output by switching the capacitor CS2 branch once 
without changing the switching frequency or compensation network. Compared with the existing uh, CC and CV scheme, it has the advantages of pure uh, components, uh, simple control, and uh, high reliability. In addition, the compensation method of uh, artificially decomposing the transmitting coil has been adopted to improve the design freedom. The design method studied in this paper can be extended to other WPT system with different topology circuits. Uh, it can be seen from the experimental results that the effect of ZVS and the constant current and constant voltage is very good. Uh, this proposed class circuit can achieve uh, ZVS operation from 7 ohm to 60 ohm or more, and the output power can achieve 450 watts. The detailed parameter design method, sensitivity analysis, and experimental verification are uh, included in four paper. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, the next paper title is the design and development of a test rig for 13.56 megahertz IPT system with synchronous rectification and bi-directional capability. Uh, paper will be presented by uh, Nunzio Pucci uh, from the Imperial College London, UK. Thank you. Yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Nuncio Pucci from the Imperial College London Wireless Power Law, and the research is mainly focused around uh, megahertz IPT systems. So the, re the relevance of this paper is because we've started recently to look into active rectifications and bidirectional power transfer system. So we decided to develop a test rig to overcome some of the issues associated with uh, uh, synchronization in general. So an error in synchronization can lead to serious damage to either of the two transceivers because of excessive heating on the uh, devices because of the reflected impedance being at the wrong value, really. So ideally, what you want to do is to assess the synchronization strategy and the um, driver topology independently. And so that's what this test rig is aiming to do. The way we achieve it is we uh, set up um, an electronic load in uh, constant voltage mode in sourcing configuration and the input voltage of either of the two coil drivers. And this is a relevant step because it allows the input voltage to be constant, uh, which is crucial for class F topologies, which are typically operated in open loop for constant voltage uh, for the input, uh, constant coil current, and constant uh, frequency. So the frequency and the phase of the uh, coil current is controlled through a signal generator that is feeding both coil driver A and coil driver B, as you can see in the bottom left picture. And this allows to emulate the ideal synchronization strategy. So you can ideally focus on the coil driver optimization. Uh, so in this paper, we've uh, shown an example on uh, transceiver optimization mainly. And we've used uh, class CF uh, load independent topology as a bidirectional coil driver. You can see in the picture on the top right, uh, that there are different results for the drain voltage waveforms at different coil current angles, uh, together with their associated power levels. Um, so we developed, uh, to summarize, we developed the test rig for bidirectional power transfer, uh, transmission. We use it to assess transceivers' performance. Um, and for the first time, we showed class CF transceivers as a bidirectional topology. It is actually pretty exciting for our group to have developed uh, this type of system because it lays the basis for bidirectional power transfer and active rectification in general, which is actually quite challenging at high frequency. And we're looking forward to showcase further work based on this uh, first project. Thanks a lot for your time. And uh, yeah, I'll answer any questions later. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move on to the, I think the last paper of the session of the, the, this week. Uh, the title is a uh, modularized uh, and reconfigurable wireless power transfer architecture modeling and analysis. Uh, the paper, the, the speaker with uh, Huan Zhang from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So, Huan. Okay, can you help me? Yes. Okay, uh, please turn to the next slides. Uh, as a common sense, a typical WPT system cannot meet the requirements of multiple applications. Now, for example, the commercial, uh, the, uh, the, the, com the commercial motion robot, the drone, or the AGV. If we want to apply the WPT function to all of these applications, we have to redesign the circuit and the coping coils. 
which means the longer design procedure and higher manufacturing cost. And low and power level is also limited by the switches, by the component switches. And in order to solve this problem, we propose a new design concept, which is the modularized and reconfigurable WPT system. Our target, our target is implementing different applications through the unit model's reconfiguration. In this design concept, we can reduce the cost and period in design and production procedures. And also this kind of modular design concept can improve the reliability and the maintainability of WPT systems. We compare three different architectures based on the efficiency, scalability, and the power, system power level. And the function modularized architecture achieves the best performance according to our research, which is shown in this page. Through the integration of megahertz operation frequency and the function modularized architecture, we can finally achieve this kind of modularized and reconfigurable WPT system, as shown in, 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 the, following, in, in, in the following page. The coping coil in each unit model is made by PCB, which is slight and easy to produce. And through the stack of the unit models, the system can achieve easily reconfiguration and satisfy different WPT application power, distance, and voltage requirements at the same time. And we also derive the mathematic models through the matrix equations to in order to represent the power and the voltage uh, relationship. And the experiment setup is shown in this picture. The diameter of this kind of PCB coils is 80 millimeters and the thickness is 0.4 millimeters. Each coil has four turns and the transfer distance is 30 to 50 millimeters. And as we can see, the power converter of each transmitting unit models occupies one quarter of the circle. When we have four transmitting unit models, and we, can, we will have a complete circle as shown in this page. Here we test four different combinations of unit models to verify the proposed design concept. And the power efficiency results are shown in the following curves pictures. According to the power figure, the proposed modularized and reconfigurable WPT system satisfy the derived power and voltage equations. And the, transfer, and the transmission efficiency achieves obviously improvements with more unit models using. Note, when the transfer power is too large, the, high, the half bridge inverter loses the ZVS working condition and which decreased efficiency as shown in the purple curve in this page, which will be improved in my future research. In this paper, we analyze and compare three different WPT architectures and choose the functional or modular, modular architecture as a system candidate. We derive the mathematic model and we briefly analyze, analyze the influence of the proximity effect and the coping divergence. Finally, we verify the, we verify the modularized design concept through the experiments. And as a conclusion, this kind of modularized and reconfigurable WPT, WPT system has quite a lot of interesting performance and it may be a good choice in future design of WPT systems. Okay, so that's all of my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I guess this is the last paper. Yeah, it is. Okay, and thank you very much for all the, uh, the, the presenters. Uh, and the, we now actually start the next half of the session. It's a Q&A session. So um, let me stop the sharing here. Okay. And put it as a gallery view. Okay. Uh, a reminder to the uh, audience, uh, please type your question in the Q&A box. Uh, or you prefer to speak, you can raise your hand and we'll recognize you and then uh, turn down your um, this, uh, the microphone function. Um, okay, so with this, I'm handing it over to uh, Professor Shinohara. We'll handle the, uh, the Q&A session. Yeah, so okay. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, all speakers. So it's time to start a Q&A session. So uh, I, uh, I'd like to uh, start the session one by one. So first of all, uh, it's time to open the question uh, Q&A time for uh, first, sorry, 
first talk, uh, uh, Mr. Shinnosuke Kawasaki's talk. So do you have any question or comment for him? And of course, uh, on the website, uh, we have some question for each speaker. So uh, I, uh, I'll pick up uh, these questions on the website later. So at first, uh, do you have any question or comment for him? Oh, sorry. So if not, I have one question. So just a moment, uh, this one. So uh, Dr. Kawasaki, so I have one question. So uh, your proposed CMUT is very interesting uh, devices, I think. But uh, I think uh, this uh, CMUT is very similar to the energy harvester by, by vibration, of course. So, and uh, especially the electrolyte MEMS uh, harvester, maybe you know, uh, yes. it's very similar to the uh, electrolyte MEMS harvester. So if it is, the output power is potential, uh, uh, proportional to the surface potential and the frequency. So can you, ex uh, uh, can your experimental result be explained by the electrolyte MEMS theory or not? Um, I'm not familiar with the electric uh, energy harvester, but typically I think it works at a different frequency. And uh, these devices that we show were originally meant for uh, ultrasound imaging, thus uh, it works around one megahertz. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, clear correlation between um, uh, surface potential to uh, the energy that's being harvested. The energy that's being harvested is proportional to the amount of energy that you send in and the efficiency of the system. That's typically 50%. So um, I think uh, uh, this device that I showed, uh, oh, and electric harvesters are harvesting energy from the environment rather than the uh, external source. Uh, so that uh, that's, I think, the main difference. Here, you expect a, a source and a receiver energy harvester based on electric electrics are uh, harvesting environmental energy, which is uh, a different mechanism. Thank you so much. So I saw the raise the hand. Uh, so Victor, so do you have some question or comment for him? Yes, I have a question for you. Um, uh, so can you elaborate a little bit more on how you measure efficiency? I just saw that in your paper. So you're using hydrophone to do like power integration over the surface or so? Right, so this is a pretty tricky uh, measurement that we do uh, in terms of actually how to execute it. Uh, what we do is we um, uh, we send an ultra we have an ultrasound source and then we send a, uh, 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 the ultrasound wave towards the CMUT, so the receiver, and then we uh, replace the CMUT with a hydrophone and scan over the exact region where the CMUT was positioned. And then we uh, calculate the amount of energy that was being received, that was hitting on the semen. So, uh, and then we uh, divide this value from the uh, amount of energy that was transferred, was uh, dissipated at the load connected to the semen. That's Thank how you. We Thank you. But one just question. So, uh, so how? I follow up, sorry, follow up question. So basically, how do you um, integrate that energy from this, the hydrophone? And also, when you get the energy, the power from your, your CMUT, um, do you put like any load inductors to like increase? Because like, um, like basically get the maximum power out or are you just putting a load resistor there? Okay, so uh, the first question, the, the, how do we integrate it? We measure the pressure and we know the acoustic impedance. So there's a formula I equals P pressure squared divided by the impedance, which gives you the intensity. And then we, from the intensity, we can integrate it to be the energy because we also set it the energy in terms of burst. So then we could uh, integrate over the entire burst. Um, for um, how, if we do matching, yes, we do matching. Uh, it's not shown on this slide, but on the paper, we uh, show that we apply a specific uh, inductive load to compensate the capacitance at the specific frequency, and we match the resistive load uh, with, the, um, with the 
electrical equivalent of modulo of the sigma as well. So it, it's what it's matched for these uh, efficiency calculations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all. So uh, unfortunately, time is limited. So let's mo uh, move on to the next uh, talks. So next is for TS92 uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Xiao. So do you have any question or comment for him? So if not, so I found some, uh, one question on the website of the conference. So I read it. So is there any existing design or system you can compare your proposal uh, with? Of course, you have already answered. So, but uh, please answer again for the audience. Uh, yes, uh, there uh, have the existing systems of the wireless power transfer. Uh, they use uh, they connect uh, the capacitor in theory or primary to connect to compensate the leakage inductance. Uh, and uh, they also have the use the heavy core to increase the transmission efficiency. Uh, so uh, this is the existing the system. Thank you for your answer. So mm. I have one more question. So mm. did you estimate the Q value or the uh, 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 coefficient of K in your system? Did you estimate the uh, Q value of your coil? Uh, I, I can't uh, mean this uh, to one. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, uh, I know, uh, so your system is a resonance yes. uh, near field WPT, right? Mm, yes. So yes. in the resonance WPT system, uh, we always consider the K and Q, co uh, coupling coefficient between coils and the quality factor of the coil to extend the distance. Uh, yes, yes, I have. So, yeah. did you estimate yeah. the quality factor in your system? Uh, uh, yes, See, uh, I have connected the capacitor to uh, increase the uh, to compass the index. Hmm. Oh, okay, <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, Please keep in touch and discuss later. <laughs> so, do you have any question and comment from uh, online? So, if not, uh, let's move on to the third speaker. So, uh, selective receiver charging. So, do you have any question and comment uh, online? Uh, so, I found one uh, Q and A uh, on chat uh, on Q and A uh, position. So. Uh, what is the efficiency of these modes and boundaries? Yes. Um, so, yeah, in the paper, there is a better um, like uh, um, drawing of the of the efficiency. So, um, and I have another question. I think in the in my um, in the in the in the HOVA about uh, the efficiency. Uh, yeah, on the website, uh, so I read can answer them question. together. I think. Yeah, yeah I think. Um, so I I don't have a way to quant. Right now, I don't have a specific way to quantify the transducer efficiency, but we quantify the entire efficiencies. Um, so um, usually, in this case, we're achieving around thirty percent efficiencies. Um, that that thirty percent is the AC to AC efficiency measure by, by using a network analyzer to measure like the input with a matched load and the inductor on the output. So um, in the past, and for this type of structure, we've been able to measure up to maybe 70% because um, all the losses, and I think um, this, uh, another question that was in there too. So all the losses uh, seem to be come from uh, two uh, sources. One is I think acoustic radiation into air while the structure vibrates. The second is um, the losses within the, um, the bonding, the glue material that we use to glue it on, uh, basically viscoelastic losses. So um, that's at least two of the uh, losses and dielectric losses in the material. Um, the other ones, we do an FES simulation, so we're not, uh, we're still in the 
process of, I guess, figuring out um, how to really quantify this. But those three, I guess, are the main law sources. So for this work, particularly, it's, um, as you see, it's around 30% um, efficiency when it is being activated. And when not being activated, it's close to zero. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. So do you have any other question and comment online? So if not, so uh, thank you, Victor. So if we have a time, uh, we go back to the uh, previous speakers. But uh, now we uh, move on to the next uh, question time. So next speaker is uh, TS94, uh, design of ultrasonic uh, transducer surface for et cetera. So, uh, for uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Zhao, do you have any question or comment? Oh, sorry. Chat. Sorry, now I received the, uh, maybe the question on uh, question on the chat. Uh, so, G Jimmy, is it a question for Victor or the current uh, Dr. Zhao? Uh, Victor, so please uh, go back to the previous one. Okay. Um, so yeah. So does your uh, system uh, 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 account for different uh, media in the pipe? And um, so actually, that's a good question. So in this case, we've been um, most of the work we've done is actually just in air right now. So we're trying to demonstrate in different things. What we have done is actually fill it with um, different, I say, lossy materials um, such as an elastic foam and those kind of things. So. In those cases, yes, we have been in, we have been uh, basically um, investigating this, and the efficiency um, so um, can will drop, but it uh, depends on, of course, the material interior into that. So, in, uh, for this case, like if you um, fill it with some kind of a soft foam material, um, it will drop uh, roughly from one case is like fifty percent dropping to around twenty five ish, twenty six ish, this kind of a thing. So that's what we uh, we're we're looking at. So. Yeah, so different filling material definitely will affect how it um, how it how it how it works. So thank you so much. So is it uh, enough uh, for Jimmy? So of course uh, we can go back to the previous speaker. So now, uh, yeah, thank you so much. So let's move on to the next. So do you have any question uh, for? Uh, you Fei Zhao? Oh, yes. No, no problem. <laughs> Thank you so much. So on the website of the conference, uh, there are a lot of, lot of questions for him. So I pick up uh, some of the questions. So of course, uh, some uh, uh, he, uh, he has already replied uh, some questions, but uh, uh, he has not replied yet uh, some questions. So. Uh, for example, a question is, uh, do you have an understanding of gross dB per meter versus uh, frequency? How did you select the operating frequency for this project? So can you answer it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in our experimental setup, we, use, we firstly use the uh, LCR meter to test the, uh, the impedance curves and then uh, the the LCR meter could be used for the uh, low power uh, supply for the like, uh, for the system. Uh, so we test uh, the transfer performance over the frequency between 10, 20 kilohertz to four hundred kilohertz per, and uh, choose the uh, best performance point. And then we designed the uh, resonant circuit and, and uh, to um, uh, increase the input power. Thank you. So, and the next question is how do you uh, exchange DC to acoustic and acoustic to DC vary with respect to? Uh, Excitation amplitude is uh, transducer re or is re transducer linear. Oh, sorry, Victor, do you have any question? Yes, no, you can you can go first with it. I'll, I'll be next, I think. 
Uh, so, uh, so uh, at the first, uh, uh, please answer the second question. Is the transducer linear or the uh, respect to the excitation amplitude? Um, could you please uh, repeat the question? Yeah, so on the website, how do uh, efficiencies, so DC to acoustic efficiency and acoustic to DC uh, efficiency, vary with uh, respect to the excitation amplitude? Mm -hmm. so, uh, we, 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 in our, in our, in, We we you we use uh, uh, DC DC converter to mm -hmm. change the uh, DC voltage to uh, high frequency DC voltage. Um, Uh, sorry, uh, I didn't uh, understand the question. Uh, sorry, so uh, please see the uh, website of the conference. Uh, so you can uh, answer, uh, answer it later. So now, uh, Victor is raising your hand. So Victor, please ask him. The question on the website sooner. Yeah, so Victor, please. Okay, uh, Dr. Zhao. Um, so again, uh, how do you measure efficiency? Is it with the LCR meter? Do you, uh, 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 we we test the output output voltage output voltage, and uh, um, uh, in the LCR meter, it will shows the input voltage and the amplitude <coughs> of the um, of the current. Uh, so we can uh, use the uh, output uh, power to and the input power to calculate the efficiency. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, of course uh, we have some questions on the website of the conference, but uh, so uh, do you have any question uh, from online? Yeah, so if we have a time, uh, we go back to the previous speaker's question time, and uh, so I'll ask uh, you again. So uh, until, uh, until the end of the session, please uh, check uh, the website of the conference. There are a lot of questions for you. So uh, let's move on to the fifth speakers. So from here, uh, the topic change uh, change to the uh, inductive uh, wireless power, power transfer. So next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. D. So do you have any question or comment from Floor? No, Floor online. Ah uh, yes, Victor. Uh, yes, Victor. Do you have question? Yeah, hello, oh. Professor. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry, I, I, I forgot to lower my hand. Sorry. sorry. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Oh. No problem. Uh, so, so, do you have, uh, again, so uh, do you have any question and comment uh, for you uh, on the uh, online? So if there is no rising hand or the question and comment, so I have one question for you. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the classy mode topology, uh, but uh, my, uh, maybe I know the class E amplifier circuit, uh, especially for the wireless power transfer. So, but uh, I cannot understand the difference between your noble uh, complex uh, class E topology and uh, conventional class E topology or the amplifier uh, from your uh, uh, only from your paper on the 
from your presentation videos. So uh, can you explain the detail of the difference between your proposed novel class E topology and the conventional one? Okay, um, I will uh, introduce in detail about the uh, decomposing the transmitter Q, right? Uh, I want to, uh, uh, we know the primary uh, inductance LP, I want in, uh, divided into LP1 and LP2. And uh, in T type uh, equivalent model, uh, if the equivalent inductance Ls uh, minus m uh, square over Lp2 and Cs1 resonant at frequency f, uh, so it, the CC mode can achieve. And uh, if the uh, parallel combination of inductance Ls minus m over uh, uh, m square over Lp2 and Cs resonant with L2 at frequency f, and the constant voltage can realize. Uh, so the decomposing the phenomenon is uh, artificially. Uh, we want the LP one um, can resonant with CP, and the LP two can uh, resonant uh, to reflect the mm. secondary, right? Mm. Mm. So is a series uh, series efficiency is the same as a uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, class E one hundred percent. So theoretical efficiency yeah. is a one hundred percent on your uh, novel system. And the novel of my circuit. Uh, 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 theoretical efficiency theory of your uh, circuit. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, I don't mean of the circuit. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, so the I'm, box. yeah, so I'm interested in your theory of your circuit. And uh, so, as you know, in class E uh, circuit, uh, theoretical conversion efficiency is a 100%, as you know. Of course, class D and class F is the same. Uh, so it's the uh, uh, same, uh, so, uh, do you have uh, same theoretical efficiency of the uh, novel class E circuit, right? 100%? Uh, yeah, 100%. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so I have to run the class E amplifier. Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. so, Thank you. Yeah, so uh, do you have any question and comment uh, from online? Ah, uh, yes. So, Kuha uh, Raman. Yes, please. Yes, um, I'll just follow up uh, the question you asked. So, what is the experimentally measured efficiency of the circuit? Okay, the uh, experimental uh, efficiency. You want to know the uh, efficiency, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, in this experimental, uh, the maximum. Uh, in CC out uh, in CC uh, in CC mode, it's about uh, uh, eighty and um, nine point three percent, right? Uh, and the maximum FCC uh, in CV mode is about nineteen point five percent. I see, right, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, do you have any other question or comment? So if not, uh, due to the time limitation, let's move on to the next uh, speakers. So thank you so much. So next uh, session is open for the uh, Mr. Put, uh, Pussy's uh, talks. So do you have any question and comment for him? So if not, uh, I have one question. Uh, so I also, uh, I'm not uh, familiar with this uh, inductive WPT, but uh, so uh, I agree. Uh, phase control uh, of the ATT is very important to uh, revise uh, efficiency. But uh, so as you know, uh, before the revolution of the resonance coupling by MIT, so we always control the phase the IPT system uh, to control the invalid power. 
with additional capacitance, and uh, it's considered as the uh, same technology with the resonance WPT theoretically. So yeah. in this meaning, is your proposal method uh, to control the phase difference uh, from the uh, resonance WPT itself or not? So yeah, well, uh, controlling the phases and the frequency is a bit of a problem when you're trying to synchronize two isolated mm -hmm. sites that are yeah. uh, active. So if you have a bidirectional power transfer, of course, you mm -hmm. cannot plug both of them simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of work in terms of synchronization strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, I mainly follow um, the work of Professor Uda Yamada Wala. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of uh, good material on the low frequency synchronization. But for high frequency synchronization, it's actually much more challenging. So, for example, mm -hmm. using sense coil becomes quite difficult, and also the bandwidth of the instrumentation kinds of uh, starts pushing the boundary. So, it's not really uh, easy to adapt those techniques. So, the main uh, research topic of my PhD is synchronization strategies of wireless power transfer systems. So, we need to lay a basis to figure out, first of all, how to optimize the transceivers and also how to optimize the uh, synchronization strategies. Uh, so yeah, this, this is the main reason why we're we're doing this because we do not have a solid synchronization strategy yet and we want to perform the assessment separately. We cannot just fossilize on a synchronization strategy and not optimize, for example, the coil drivers. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Mm, thank you so much. So, uh, so I agree okay. with you. It's very new and interesting technology at that frequencies. So thank you so much. All right, so, thanks. Do you have any question or comment from online? So if not, so unfortunately, uh, let's move to the last uh, talks uh, uh, Q&A time. So uh, now, now uh, uh, we open the Q&A uh, Q uh, for uh, Mr. Tan, uh, moderated and recordable uh, WPT talk. So, uh, do you have any uh, question and comment from online for him? So, if not, uh, so again, uh, I have one question uh, for you. So, so it's very interesting work uh, uh, with a uh, 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 mo uh, module WPT system. So, uh, it's very easy to uh, construct the commercial WPT system, I agree with you. But uh, for example, on the uh, left bottom side picture, so this is a, a modular WPT system. It means, so you provide the power equally to each coils uh, to the transmitter side. So uh, 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 so coil one, two, 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 N, you equally provide the power, but uh, if, uh, you uh, you don't provide any power to the mid coils, so this coils becomes a parasitic uh, coils, and uh, uh, we can apply the this uh, resonance coils uh, only uh, to feed uh, in and out as a transmitter. I think. How do you think about it? Uh, sorry, I, I beg your pardon for the for the center of your question. I I I, I didn't follow that one. Uh, so, I'm sorry. So, so now uh, you uh, you provide the power uh, 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 megahertz power into each coils in the transmitters one two yes, three yes. n. But uh, if yeah. uh, we uh, we don't provide any power into the mid coil two three four or the other, and uh, you only provide the power to the one and n only. I okay. suppose uh, mid coils play a role of the parasitic coil, and uh, uh, we can apply uh, total uh, coils uh, as a uh, uh, power feeded coil additional uh, plus uh, so parasitic coils. Okay. Can you uh, <laughs> maybe I guess a, I guess a I get a point, but let me explain all of this. Yeah. Uh, the first thing is in my design concept that mm. each module should. Get the uh, the balance power, it which means that yeah, um, for, for the modules one to n, the every power should be equal to the center. It should, should be should, should be equivalent. Mm -hmm. And if we want the lower power requirement, we can mm -hmm. directly decrease the modules we use. Mm -hmm. We remove the modules, not just mm -hmm. 
disconnect the model. So we need to remove the models because it's, it's useless in this kind of design. Mm -hmm. Thus, in this application, each modules have the same power to mm -hmm. transfer. And it is very important because we need to calculate the cross coupling between the coil. We need to maintain the power is, is, is balanced. And mm -hmm. in this way, we can maintain the, maintain the compensation of this cost mm -hmm. cross coupling always working. So this is the uh, previous working condition of this kind of uh, WPT system, the modulized mm -hmm. WPT system. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. So I suppose uh, my question and your uh, answer is very similar, I suppose. So uh, very so great. So thank you so much. Okay. So do you have any question? Uh, sorry, on the chat. Uh, thank you, already. <laughs> so uh, do you have any question or comments from Flora and uh, from online? If not, so uh, thank you for all speaker and uh, thank you so much. So unfortunately, uh, due to the time restriction, uh, we have to close this session and uh, this is our last technical session of the WPT, uh, WP, uh, W. So Jensen, do you have a uh, last comment? Uh, no, yeah, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Naoki. Thank you very much for handling the <laughs> session. Uh, while we're getting ready for the the last closing and award ceremony sessions. Okay, yeah, thank so, you very much. Uh, thank you for all. So we have to close this session and uh, please keep you online to attend the closing session. So thank you so much and thank you for all. Yeah, and thank for all the speakers for answering the questions. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, so um, yeah, so as uh, so a speaker, if you feel free to uh, stay with us. Um, and then now at the official announcing that we are going into the closing uh, sessions and award ceremony. Um, so uh, joining with me, actually, we have the um, TPC uh, chairs from the WPTC and WOW with me, uh, Professor Zeishi Chow and Professor Kuren Afridi. Okay. Uh, our general chair, um, Professor Chris Mee, unfortunately, is, uh, has uh, the other important business to take care of the, uh, the university duty, so cannot be with us uh, in this uh, closing session. Um, and then also joining us is uh, Mr. Golden Bear from the uh, Energers. Okay. Uh, Golden here uh, will be representing the Energers to uh, virtually present the award certificate to our award winners here. And thank you, Golden, for joining us. Okay. Thank you for uh, having me. Okay. Um, and also, I see that we also have the uh, Professor Liu Cheng Chang, uh, the ICPOE Power Electronic Society President, joining us here. And thank you, uh, Professor Chang, for joining us. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay, thank you. And then, so this uh, closing uh, session, the best we, we're going to have the um, awards uh, presented first and by the awards committees. And, and then I will hand it over to JC to, to handle this part. And then after award presentation done, JC is gonna talk about the, uh, the, the journal special issue for the expanded paper. So I think authors will be interested on that. And then after that, we'll ask the, the next year, 2022's uh, WPW, Wise Power Week 2022. You're probably curious where they're gonna be uh, so the Professor Simon Moore is here, going to tell us about that. And then lastly, we have the uh, Professor Nuro Carvajal, uh, going to uh, talk about the ICPOE the WPT initiative, okay, and also the WPT school next year. Uh, so, and now I see also the Zoya, the award committee chair, joining us, and same as the Fei Lu, the presenting the award committee chair from WOW. Okay, thank you, everyone. So with this, I'm going to hand it over to JC. Sure. Uh, let me share my presentation. Okay, I want to make sure everybody can see it. The paper competition. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, this uh, this slide is uh, showing the, our uh, paper competition committee, uh, Professor Chen. Professor Himur, Professor Popovic uh, are for WPTC paper competition and Professor Liu uh, is, was in charge for paper competition for WOW. 
And now I will have Professor uh, Popovic. Uh, oh, I forgot because uh, our competition has to be anonymous. So although we have a lot of help uh, from many researchers, we cannot disclose their name. Uh, so I use my cat to represent them. So uh, now I will have a uh, Professor Popovic uh, explaining about the rule for paper competition. Thank you, JC. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of my co-chairs who did a lot of the work here and JC was indispensable. Thank you very much for all your help. So the process was we selected 37 papers with the top scores given by reviewers. And then we selected 15 finalists from the top 37 papers, five in each category. After that, we selected five judges for each category, which were the student industry and best overall paper. Following the judge selection, um, the judges reviewed the videos, the papers, the slides, and asked questions during the live presentations or, and or uh, written through the online uh, site. And then finally, we collected this morning the scores and comments and had a long discussion. And the winner was chosen by the committee based on the total numerical score. And with that, I think it's time to announce our winners. Uh, yes, uh, we are very happy uh, to have uh, Mr. Gordon Bell Great. to announce yes, thank uh, you. the paper awardee. Yeah, thank you for uh, allowing me to join this special event. I joined uh, the wireless power industry uh, back in 2013. and I've never been more excited about the technology advancements that we're seeing today. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, a lot of different presentations that uh, went on this week and already looking forward to uh, the event next year. Um, okay, so uh, but before you start, um, I would like to ask uh, our host or co-host uh, take pictures, especially uh, Mr. Bell and our uh, awardee. Uh, if, um, oh, I'm sorry, we can't show the awardee because they are in the attendee um, uh, role, uh, but we will have a photo taken between uh, Mr. Bell and the certificate. So now the best paper, best student paper award. The best student paper award uh, goes to Christos Konstantopoulos, uh, Thomas Osmuller from the University of Innsbruck, Austria, Europe. Now the second place. A uh, second place awarded for embroidered, I'm sorry if I, if I skipped the last one, uh, embroidered textile coils for wireless charging of smart garments. And the award goes to Chinwei Zhang and Jensen Lin, University of Florida, as well as Patrick Rail from Analog Devices. Now the moment of truth. <laughs> The best paper, a best student paper, the first place. First place is awarded for transparent and flexible self dual antennas for hybrid inductive, capacitive, and radiative power transfer. The winners named are Liang Zhu, Zhu Kong Ye, Pai Yen Chen from the University of Illinois at Chicago, as well as LJ Guao from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Next will be the best industry paper, and there will be only one winner. And the winner is for a highly efficient and high degree of freedom of position, kilowatt class wireless power transfer system in seawater for small AUVs. The winners are Ryosuke Hasaba, Tatsuo Yagi, Tatsuya Okamato, uh, Suchi Kawata, Suchiro Yamaguchi, Satoru Kotani, Kazuhiro Iguchi, and Yoshio Koyonagi from Panasonic Corporation of Japan. The next award is the best conference paper award. And there's only one award for this competition. And the winner is 
The winner for best conference paper is for selective receiver charging using acoustic vibration modes is Victor Farmgu Tseng, Nathan Lazarus, Sarah Bader from the US Army Research Laboratory, Adelphi, Maryland, Daniel Diamond, Sarah Goodrich from Rochester Institute of Technology in New York, and Joshua Radis from US Naval Academy in Annapolis. Okay, uh, the next one is the best student paper award for WOW. And there's only uh, one award for this category. The best student paper prize for 2020 IEEE workshop on emergency technologies, wireless power, is used by awarded to Puji Li, Ming Liu, Yang Wang from Shanghai Jiao Tong University for their paper entitled, A Novel Hybrid Class E Topology. <laughs> with, um, I think it's Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with load independent output for wireless power transfer. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, okay, so the next uh, one is uh, the best conference paper award and there's only one in this category. The award for best paper prize uh, goes to Nuncio Pucci, Juan Arteaga, and Paul Mitchelson from the Imperial College of London for their paper entitled Design and Development of a Test Rig for 13.56 megahertz IPT systems with synchronous rectification and biodirectional capability. I think it will. Well, thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, it's, um, it's great to have you present all this award to students. And uh, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, uh, not just the winner of the paper competition, but all the authors, because uh, our paper acceptance rate is uh, very low. And uh, you guys are all down outstanding. All the authors uh, for a few things. Uh, number one, for the award uh, winner, uh, for the competition winner, uh, you will be receiving email from us uh, because there's a cash award and uh, you have to fill out the tax form and you have to send it back by deadline or you won't get your award prize. And also we will announce uh, the awards uh, at uh, social uh, network, uh, social media. And uh, we will, if you would like to share this with, you, with your friends in your social media, please, uh, you are very welcome to do so. And we would like to uh, uh, showcase uh, our uh, paper in the public and especially uh, the awards uh, competition awardee. And also I would like to remind uh, all the authors that uh, we have a special issue planned for journals. And this has been emailed to all the authors uh, in advance. So that gives you some time to prepare it. Uh, you can target uh, one of this or all of them uh, to submit your extended uh, paper. Uh, but of course, uh, you have to make sure that uh, you follow the rule for the specific uh, uh, journal. There are transactions on microwave theory and techniques. Uh, the expected uh, publication, del uh, publication date is March, 2022. Uh, journal of Electromagnetics, RF and Microwave in Medicine and Biology. This uh, journal particularly target for medical application. Uh, exp expected day for publication is January 1st, 2022. And also MDPI, sensors and electronics. These are two journals that have a joint special issue for this conference. And the expect, expected uh, publication date is uh, December 1st. I'm sorry, it's December 1st, 2021, not 2022. 
And uh, I would like to thank for uh, all the TPC committee uh, members, chairs and co-chairs uh, for this, uh, for their contribution, time and effort. A lot of uh, work was done in a very short time, very rushed, especially uh, the award committee. Uh, the award committee uh, three chair are in three different time zones that is furthest point from each other on earth. So uh, they very often have to stay very late uh, in order to communicate with each other. And also uh, all the judges, although I cannot disclose your names, uh, your effort, times, and contribution will not be forgotten. And thank you very much. And I will pass this uh, stage to uh, Dr. Lin. Well, thank you, JC. Thank you very much for a very well prepared uh, award presentation. So I have to say that I'm, I'm the award committee operating in a completely um, uh, strictly confidential mode. So I have no idea who are the winners until the, uh, the very end. <laughs> and congratulations oh, yes. to all the winners. <laughs> Sorry, I, I forgot to mention that is that everything, everything we kept very confidential. There's only four person uh, plus me know about this result um, until 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for all your hard work, including all the judges. So I guess you mentioned that we probably want to take a photo uh, with all the awardees. I think I see many of them in the, in the attendees list. So I guess what we can do is that we ask the um, award these uh, recipients, you probably can stay on till the very end. Uh, we're gonna take you one by one to promote to the panelists that we can take a group photo in the end, kind of like uh, um, the end of the conference party, virtual party, okay? <laughs> so with that, um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Professor Simon Hamo to talk about the next year's plan. It's not going to be virtual, right? <laughs> Hopefully not. Can you hear me and see my slide? Yes. Coming okay. up. Okay. Uh, okay, good. Okay. Thank you very much, Jenshan. <laughs> uh, so, although it's 3 a.m. in France, it's a great pleasure for me um, to invite you to Bordeaux on behalf of the organizing committee for the next year Wireless Power Week. The conference motto is let's meet again. And don't get me wrong, I truly enjoy listening to the technical talk during this conference. And I enjoyed the many interactions that has been triggered. Um, but I do miss this special link we get during in-person conference. And as you know that Bordeaux belongs to the most attractive city on earth, it's surely the best place to reconnect with real life conference, don't you think? So we are heading from Japan. 10 years ago, we were speaking about wireless power there. And then MTTS, PELS started their own conference and four years ago, we collocated all of those conferences. And this is very great that now we have been able to sign this MOU to have finally a single event next year. So we have an amazing organizing committee and this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have wonderful TPC chairs, Paul Mitchison from UK, John Ho from Singapore, Luca Roselli from Italy and general chairs from France, from Simon, myself from Bordeaux, Alex from Toulouse and Bruno from Lyon. This is a conference layout. We are actually going to have two full days dedicated to student summer school. And then starting July 6, we will have the three days conference. Let me highlight a few points of this layout. We will have a French gastronomy lunch every day. There will be three course meal, wine pairing, and all of this will be included in, in registration 
to make sure that everyone can get the opportunity of friendly networking. We will have a welcome reception with a welcome speech from the mayor of Bordeaux. This is on the downtown, 15 minutes from the venue. And this would be very great because walking distance from the overall heritage city center. We will have a networking event with a massive submarine pen dating from World War II and a sophisticated wine museum. The banquet, do you remember the picture in the beginning of my talk? We will have the banquet right here in this great, amazing building. So the wireless power week is going to integrate the wireless power conference, one, the industrial expo. We, have, we are going to have the student paper competition, the wireless power summer school. There will be multiple opportunities for journal special issue paper extension. But we will also organize for the first time an international academic design competition, very special of its kind. There will be an energy harvesting summit. There will be a research team hardware competition and for sure those networking lunches and evening will be awesome, I believe. But we also want you to come with a family. This is, Bordeaux is the largest urban area classified by UNESCO. There is more than 7,000 chateau around Bordeaux. It's very close to the Atlantic Ocean. And for sure, this is a great place for gastronomy and delight. So we are all inviting you to come to Bordeaux. Let's meet again. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. I look forward to that. And certainly I think you'll prepare a lot of wine for us, right? The outstanding French wine, I look forward to that. Okay, so next uh, we'll ask uh, Professor Nilo Cabajo um, to, to talk about the, the ICPOE uh, WPT project, which has a very interesting new initiative. Uh, with effort from researchers, uh, engineers from different society within ICPOE. So, you know. Okay, so thank you very much. Good night for all of you and good morning, good afternoon. And thanks for talking a little bit about the IEEE WPT project, which actually the community started uh, two years ago, right? when the pandemic started, which was not a very good <laughs> start for our program. But let me talk a little bit about this program. So this is a sponsored project sponsored by IEEE. And the objective of this project is actually to gather in the same place different researchers from different fields, from different societies, and bring all together to these amazing reunions we have discussions on the topic of wireless power transfer. So let me give you a brief overview of what we are at this moment. We have colleagues from MTT, from PELS, from Antennas and Propagation, from Council of RFID, from Circuits and Systems, ZMBS, CMC. So you see, we have a significant number of societies bring together to actually work towards WPT. And we start some uh, working groups for actually talk and brainstorm about these activities on applications, near field, far field, swipe, TMC. And we are at this moment starting also to write a white paper. And of course, you are all invited to come to our website. We put a website in place. Uh, there is a very interesting who's who in the world on WPT, and there is a form on the website. So please go there, fill out the form. We want to populate the, the map as much as we can with the best experiences and the best researchers around the world. Let me also say that in our website, Professor Naoki Shinohara is, is actually doing a very nice work bringing together the standards that are there and you can actually 
uh, download some of these standards. They are free to download and you can actually see what is happening. We have some history on WPT also so that you can have this information. And as Simon was saying, uh, we help to organize the WPT school. So this year was the third edition. Next year is going to be the fourth edition of the school. And I imagine that next year is going to be a huge event. It's going to be five days full of school. It's going to be a really summer school in July in Bordeaux with good food, good wine, and good technical content and the best keynote speakers we can find in the world. So I think this concludes my fast inter uh, intervention. Uh, and the message I want to say here is everybody is welcome in our activity. The objective is, is mainly to promote this uh, WPT among students, among researchers, and create awareness for WPT within the IEEE society. So thank you very much. And thanks, Jen Chen and JC for letting me present this uh, interesting project. Thank you. Thank you, Nilo. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, I uh, I guess we have to finish this uh, wise power week. Uh, finally, we come to the final moment, and I want to say a thank you very much. Uh, this is a totally unexpected uh, virtual event for us, and then in the end, we had more than two thousand five hundred attendees when we started. We only expected no more than five hundred, and we ended up uh, five times. <laughs> better than that. And this has helped us to create a very large, dynamic, exciting virtual conference. And the attendees, um, you actually can see all the attendees in the virtual platform. Um, we have attendees from industry, from academia, from the government, all three sectors. And the industry, we have a sponsoring company. And thank you very much for your generous uh, sponsoring your support. Um, and then many more companies uh, joining us. In academia, we have a university professor, graduate student, undergraduate student. And actually, we even have a high school student. I believe we have at least one joining us. Uh, in the government, we have uh, uh, the research lab, uh, researcher joining us. And also, we have funding agencies, program managers, program directors joining us. And not only that, actually, um, among attending, we have uh, investors interested in connecting with the technology uh, startup companies. So if you're interested, look for that. Actually, it's uh, the virtual platform uh, that there's a that's called community board, and you can find us a topic about this. Uh, so I encourage you to look for that. And there's also the, some media companies, and I found that as at least I noticed uh, at least one uh, major media company from UK actually the uh, people here with us all the time. Uh, I won't tell you who they are. You can try to find them. Uh, then, so the even though we well, live sessions for this week, uh, we have to conclude this, uh, but the activity, we don't stop here. The virtual conference platform will remain open for uh, an, another month. So please feel free to continue to use it and explore and connect with uh, speakers and other attendees. And again, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, attending this uh, exciting conference. And thank you. Uh, so I guess we conclude this week's activity. And then finally, I would like to ask the uh, award recipients to join us. So I guess JC and I, we are the co-hosts. We can try to find them in attendees list and then promote them to panelists. And then we can take a, a so-called group photos here. Oh, I also uh, see the uh, Amia, uh, co TBC coach Amia joining us. And yes. also several of the committee members joining us, Tenzi, Subic, yes. Great to see you here. And Al, wonderful. Okay. And please, uh, awardee, uh, raise your hand in the attendee so I can uh, promote you. So JC, you do from top, I do from bottom. How's that? Sure. Hi, 
Okay. Do we have uh, everyone? I have all the hands cleared. Okay. We missing anyone? I guess uh, uh, a work committee can can tell. Uh, actually, um, there might be some mistake uh, because the Zoom kind of delay half second. Um, okay. So sometimes the one you click is not the one you click. Well, actually, why don't we do it this way? We can uh, let everybody join us. How is that? Oh, still yeah. Here. Was, I don't know how to do that. Uh, I don't think we can do it uh, as one command. I guess we'll do it one by one. <laughs> okay. Um... So for all the attendees still here, so we're going to click you, promote you to panelists. Yeah. So you can join the us. The more the merrier. I also want to thank you for staying with us till the very end. Hi, uh, I'm having some issues, I think, with the video because it says that the host has stopped it. I don't know if it needs to be unlocked or something by the host. Uh, sorry, said again, you said uh, um, uh, yeah, it says it, I cannot start the video because, ah, okay, fine. Fix it. Thank you. Oh, okay. Good. Good. Okay, we put everybody in here. Okay. Um, so I see somebody raise a hand. Huji. Okay. Got it. Lower your hand. Everybody here. And Zichao, are you here? Uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. Okay, so we ask everybody to turn on the camera, if you could, and then we're going to take a group photo. So I guess, uh, JC, you can take one, I can take another one. Um, the way I'm going to do is a screen share, I mean, screenshot. I'm waiting for uh, more people to turn on the video. Okay. Um, and also, don't blink. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, Yongxin. I see you. Hey, Yongxin. Hi, Opening. So we can wait for okay. a few more seconds. Sure. I'm going to do several continuously. Okay. I'm going to say three, two, one, cheese. Okay, so let me take it here. Three, two, one, cheese. Great, done. Uh, take one more, maybe. Three, two, one. Say, why is power? Why is power? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, there will be, a, I think, historical moment. Maybe, uh, hopefully, it will be the last one like this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So I know that our yeah. European colleagues have been the same for a very long night. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I really appreciate this. 
Um, but uh, all the party near to come to end, so we had to turn off the light. <laughs> so you can go back to the bed, uh, and then I can go get my dinner. <laughs> Thank you, then. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you, you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye. 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 Stay Bye. safe. Stay healthy. Bye. 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 Bye